Good morning. Okay, everybody's got on vests and sweaters. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> I know it. Um, <clears throat> this is only a four page. Usually I show up with six or seven or whatever, so we might be done in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, and then I, I was also, he, he was kind enough to point out a typo. So the title, First Timothy, is supposed to be 1 1 through 2 7. So if anybody wants to fact check me, that's it. Um, I titled it Spiritual Father Son Talk. And this is going to be just looking at these few verses in First Timothy. And it's a letter between Paul to his young disciple, Timothy. And it's all about how just very practical theology, which really starts in the latter part of two, three, and four. But we're just going to look at this first part. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you give us your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the means to be able to understand your living and active word. Um, Jesus, thank you for coming to fulfill everything prophesied in the Old Testament culminating in the cross, the resurrection, your ascension, and then when you return in glory to collect all the people in this room who are in Christ, Lord. So we're so grateful. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> okay, so you kind of, I'm going to kind of weave in a little bit of background and history and geography and all that. So we got to kind of go back to, uh, we looked at this many times, but but before Paul became a Christian, Paul was born in Tarsus, which is in Turkey. So a lot of his missionary trips were centered in Turkey. Um, and so we're going to go back to where he his, his Jewish name was Saul. His Greek name was Paul. So he says, but Saul, they just had, they just had, had stoned to death Stephen. And this is where Saul's introduced in the book of Acts. And so they stoned Stephen to death. And then Saul, who's a young Pharisee, says, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So he wanted to take the persecution on the road, and he wanted to go to Damascus. And it says, and if he found any belonging to the way, which is an early name for Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way and he approached Damascus, so he's, uh, he's on the outskirts of getting into Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, causing him to falling to the ground. And then he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And laying prostrate on the ground, he says, who are you, Lord? And he's Jewish, so that's, who are you, Yahweh? And they said to him, I am Jesus. You're correct. I'm Yahweh. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So that's his conversion experience. And so... Saul was one of those guys that's like, he'll never be a Christian. We might as well not even, we just need to avoid that guy. And so God can save anybody at any time. And he did with Saul. And the thing that I want to kind of let linger is, Saul, go into the city and you will be told what you are to do. This was not a volunteer. He is summoned and he said, I'm now going to have a guy named Ananias come talk to you and he's going to tell you what you're supposed to do, what I'm going to do through you. In Acts chapter 9, 16, a couple of verses later, this is Jesus talking to Ananias. He says, for I, Jesus, will show Paul how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Paul has been converted summoned by god and all he knows is his job description is going to involve suffering so back to the uh opening line of first timothy and this is this was written written later in paul's life and it was probably written around 63 a.d for um paul and we're told an apostle which we're going to talk about that an apostle of christ jesus 
by the command of God our Savior. And it's it's kind of it's not it's a few places, but usually you're it said Jesus our Savior. But here it says by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. So God our Savior, Christ Jesus is our hope. And he says, I'm an apostle. So let's look at that a little bit. In in Luke chapter six, it said, and he, when the day had, when the day came, Jesus called his disciples because he had this big group of people following him. So he gets all of his disciples, which was a lot of them, and from them it says, chose from the disciples twelve whom he named apostles. And so there were twelve apostles, and that means sent ones or messengers. And so there are these, and this is a. Uh, an office really that came with a lot of authority and so now he's got the 12 apostles well you know judas was part of the original 12 and he flunked out of apostle school and so judas is gone they need to find a replacement and we're told in acts 126 they cast lots for them and the lot fell on matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles it was 11 because number 12 died <laughs> Later, Paul's talking about he was the last man on the he was the last apostle, but he God saved him in a miraculous, miraculous way on the road to Damascus. Then he, Jesus, appeared to James and then to all the apostles, talking about post-resurrection. Jesus spent 40 days on earth and saw all of the all of the apostles. He appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, last of all. As to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And it was a prerequisite of being an apostle that you saw and spent time with Jesus. So Paul was the last guy, and he became an apostle when it, by the command of God. So he's writing the book. In most of the Pauline epistles, they're written to the church at Ephesus, at Philippi, at Colossae. But this is a personal letter. First and second Timothy is to Timothy. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, Paul was never married, and he didn't have any kids, but he had a lot of spiritual children. And he says, Timothy, my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace. And you read these things, and you're like, grace, mercy, and peace, and you just keep going. But those are very significant words. He's saying that you need God's grace, God's mercy, and God's shalom, and they come from God the Father and Christ, and just whenever you, in the New Testament, whenever you see the word Christ, it's the New Testament version of the word Messiah in the Old Testament, so in, when you think about Jesus Christ, it's Christ is the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, means Savior, our Lord, so <clears throat> this is interesting stuff, he said up there, God, our Savior, here he says, God, our Father, and Christ Jesus is our Lord. So <clears throat> he's talking to Timothy, my one true child in the faith. Let me show you how Paul got to meet Timothy. Paul came also, this is in Acts 16, he's on one of his missionary trips. He came also to Derby and Lystra. Lystra is where Timothy's from. And it says when Paul got there, a disciple was there. So there's already some believers in Lystra. Paul arrives, and there was a disciple there named Timothy. And Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. So his mom was a believer, but his father was a Greek. We're not told if he was a believer. He just said, he's not Jewish. He's a Greek. He was well-spoken, talking about Timothy. Timothy was well-spoken of by the brothers, so the church was aware of him, both in Lystra and Iconium. So this young guy, Timothy, had kind of made a name for himself in two different cities. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and so his mom's Jewish, his dad's Greek. Because his dad's Greek, he was never circumcised. And so Paul's like, I want to take this guy with me. And Paul wasn't in the, he had Titus who was never circumcised, but Paul's like, Timothy's going to come in handy, but I need to tell him, if you want to follow me, here's what, here's one of the first things he took him and circumcised him. So Paul went and circumcised Timothy 
So he would, they would traffic in this whole area with amongst the Jews and the Gentiles, but he thought this would be good. If he didn't care about it from a, you have to be circumcised because he had many other followers who were not, but he chose to circumcise Timothy because of the Jews who were in those places where they all knew that his father was a Greek. So first day, first day of work says, drop them. <laughs> so... Uh, he's a little flint rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. You go over into uh, Titus, and this has to do as I'm chasing down God our Savior a little bit. In Titus chapter three, it says, "For we ourselves were once," and this is describing each one of us before you became a Christian. For we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Not a lot of good fellowship. Mm -hmm. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of, here's the phrase, God our Savior appeared, God our Savior saved us. <clears throat> He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So we're all a mess. We need to have mercy. We need to be washed because we're dirty. And we need to be renewed because, with the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we got God, our Savior, God, the Father, our Savior, Jesus, our Savior, so that be, by being justified, and we've said justification when we did Romans, I said it every week, I'll say it again. Justification is a legal term. We've got a record of sin that we got from Adam, but we have our own record of sin that we've done ourselves, and it needed to be dealt with. Christ dealt with it on the cross so that we, when you become a Christian, you're immediately, your legal problems with God are over. You have been justified. We have Christ's righteousness of, imputed to us. So being justified by his grace, nothing to do with works, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So continuing, Paul says that the first chapter let me just kind of set the first chapter is really just like the prelude and then he gets into chapter two and we'll see that in a minute so it says i paul urged you timothy when i was going to go to macedonia i was leaving ephesus i was going to macedonia to remain at ephesus so he's, he has told his young guy timothy i need you to stay in ephesus they got a lot of issues with that church there and I need you there. So this is a, a letter from Paul who's left Ephesus to Timothy telling him how he ought to operate in Ephesus. Ephesus was in Turkey. It was one of the major uh, wealth areas in the Roman Empire. One of their claims to fame is they had this giant temple of Artemis or Diana. It was, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And you might recall from reading Acts is that Paul, there were so many, he stayed in Ephesus. Paul was in Ephesus for three years and he had so many people coming to Christ that they weren't buying the little idols of Artemis. And so all the silver makers got together, the guild of the sil silver makers, and they said, we got to do something about this guy because he's driving us out of business because nobody wants an idol anymore. And it became a big thing. And Paul had to like get out of town over the persecution. So, he goes, well, I, he, I told him to remain in Ephesus so that you may charge. And he says this in the negative. He says, because there's some, there some heresy that was taking place in Ephesus. And it was such a metropolitan city and lots of ideas. So he says that you may charge certain persons, which he refers to this term, cert certain persons later. You may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine because they're he's Paul and Timothy are there preaching the gospel and they're teaching them the truth out of the scriptures. He says, 
You can't add to that. So tell these people to stand down and not teach any different doctrine, nor, which is another way of saying not to, devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God. That word stewardship, it basically means uh, your household is in order. And so what he's saying is that you got all these people that were probably the Jewish people, and they're like, we're way into all the genealogies. Because what was important to them is that they wanted to be able to literally say, I can, I can go through genealogies and I can show you that I am a blood relative of Father Abraham back in the day. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And you might recall so when the two, uh, when the two tri the 12 tribes split, and the northern tribes were conquered first by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians didn't do an exile like the Babylonians did. The Assyrians said, this is the way we conquer people. We fill the place up with our people and make them intermarry, and it destroys their uh, bloodlines. And so that's what became the Samaritans. And so the Jewish people are like, you Samaritans are bad news because you're no longer, you've corrupted the bloodline of Abraham. So this whole genealogy thing was kind of a big deal. And they were making that like, you gotta, you gotta show your papers and show what your lineage is. So miss endless genealogies and it promotes speculation. So everybody's standing in judgment of each other. Are you really a true Jewish person? And so it was division rather than having their household in order. Second Timothy, the next book that Paul wrote to him in chapter two, says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. This is very prevalent today. When people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. It's like, I got my own set of passions and I need to have somebody endorse my passions rather than being said, you, you're, you're, you need to follow the scripture. And we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So that's what Paul's telling Timothy you're going to be dealing with in Ephesus. Verse five, the aim of our charge is love. The whole thing that we're trying to do, love unifies, all this other stuff creates division. So that Timothy, if you wanted to just keep your job description simple, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Let me comment on that. One, and we talk about this a lot in here, is that the Bible says in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked beyond cure. Who can know it? So how in the world do you get a pure heart? Because that's what he says, from a pure heart. And it's because God gives us a new heart. He takes out our heart of stone and gives us a new heart. So the heart of a believer is a good, pure heart. And it says a good conscience. So we're aware it's Paul in kind of Romans six and seven. He says, I now have a new nature. I have a new heart. I now I want to do the right thing, but he still struggles. And we all struggle with why do I keep doing the thing I don't want to do? And why don't I do the thing I want to do? But we now have a conscience and we have a pure heart and a good conscience. And we have a sincere faith. And the reason the faith part is so important is we are saved by faith not a result of work. So when I mess up, my faith is solid because it's in Christ's finished work. So he says, certain persons, there's that phrase again, certain persons by swerving from these, what are the these, is that pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law. So you got all these people that they're trying to get them back under the Mosaic law. And it says this about the folks in Ephesus. These people that want to be teachers without understanding. They're teaching about something they don't understand. They don't understand the real purpose of the law, which we're getting ready to look at in very clear terms. Uh, without understanding either what they are saying or things about which they make confident assertions. They're just, they're acting, if you act like you know what you're talking about, maybe people will believe you. That's kind of their deal. So here's Paul telling Timothy, 
about the law. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So he's saying the law was given for a particular reason. And the law is good. The law is not bad, but the law is good only if you use it lawfully the way it was designed. And this next section of scripture is very, it's not unclear. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just. Make note of that. Who are the just? Believers. We've been justified. We're in Christ. So the law is not laid down for the just. We've been released from the law. But for the lawless and the disobedient. And then he's going to go through this litany of way of things about what a lawless, disobedient person looks like. Looks like. For the ungodly and sinners, the unholy, the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality. That's not a popular trumpet to play right now, but this is what he's saying. Men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else. So then he throws in the kitchen sink, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the good news, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So he's saying, tell these people to quit teaching the law to the believers because we've been released from the law. God is not against the law, but he's taken the law and from external tablets, he's put it on our heart to where we just want to keep it naturally. For by works of the law, Romans 3, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's why it's for the unjust. The law is there to make you aware of your sinfulness. Back to Paul here. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. So the strength that Paul's saying that I'm operating out of is this strength that Christ Jesus our Lord because he has judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. So way back on the road to Damascus, he made Paul, he converted him, he made him an apostle, and he said that he has appointed him to this service, who formerly, though formerly, Paul's talking to Timothy, I was a blasphemer. When I was a Pharisee, I was out, I was part of the problem, not the solution. I was a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy. He received mercy on the road to Damascus. When God said, he blinded him, he said, go into town, this guy, I'm going to send a guy to you, you'll get your sight back, and I, you're going to be told of everything you're supposed to do, and yes, it involves suffering. And Paul, this is by his third missionary journey, he's been beaten, shipwrecked, <laughs> whipped, starvation so paul has endured a lot of suffering as he writes this letter and this is the way he refers to it i received mercy because i had acted ignorantly in unbelief i was i had no belief i had to change my mind about who i thought messiah was and the grace of our lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. If he looks back at his conversion and says, God's grace overflowed to me. And it's like, I can't believe that he rescued me because I was a persecutor of the church and now he's made me an apostle. So Paul's just telling Timothy to keep your perspective. First Corinthians 15, nine, <clears throat> this is an interesting progression. I'm going to read three different verses, and it has to the way Paul refers to himself. And the first one is out of 1 Corinthians 15. It was written about 56 AD. Paul describes himself, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he's saying, I'm of all the apostles, I'm the least because I'm the guy, I was a persecutor of the church. You go a little bit later <clears throat> to the book in Ephesians in 61 AD, Paul says to me, though I am the very least of all of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Say, wait a minute. 
He's going backwards because he said, I'm the least of the apostles. Now he says, I'm actually the least of all of the saints mm -hmm. of all the believers. I'm now the I'm last guy. So you're like, Paul, man, come on. What's you, you got a bad self-esteem. Mm -hmm. But what Paul's this is part of the progression in the Christian life. He must increase. I must decrease. And I think this was a C.S. Lewis deal. But if I had a shirt, a white shirt, and it had I ate too much bacon at Bubba's and I got grease spots all over my white shirt, but I'm in a darkly, a dimly lit room, then I'm I'm totally good with my bacon stained shirt. But the closer I walk into the light and the brighter the light is, the more I recognize wow, I got a lot of stains and stuff. And so I think that's part of our progression is that the, the more we confidently go into the presence of God, he gently is pointing out to us, our, and we should be very humble because we're saved by grace. So Paul's like, Are you, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the very least of all saints. And here's what he writes to Timothy. This saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance. So pay attention, Timothy that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his mission. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So again, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of saints. I'm the foremost of all sinners that have ever sinned. That's where he's at mentally, and he's grateful for it. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, in case you forgot, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul's like, I am totally comfortable with the fact that God showed me great mercy. And if you, he, he's a walking billboard for like, if he can save me, he can save anybody. That's Paul's perspective. Next verse, and then he Paul Paul tells Timothy all this, and he kind of breaks into a, a prayer to the King of the Ages, <clears throat> immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, Amen. So he's all fired up for his young guy Timothy. <clears throat> then he says this is because he said, you remember he said, charge these guys to quit talking about a different doctrine. Our charge is about love. So he says, this charge, which he's already told him about, everything needs to be in love. I entrust to you, Timothy, again, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So there's in 2 Timothy, it references this, is that they laid hands on him and they prayed over him and kind of uh, said, you've got a lot of spiritual gifts, Timothy, we're bestowing on you. And he says, but one of the things I wanted to call attention to is that we all in, we're, we're all engaged in a war. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, authorities, the dominion, the evil, uh, satanic realm. And so we're at war, even though we don't recognize it sometimes. Here's what you've got to do. Holding the faith. Because when enough adversity piles up, you've got to hold on to your faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, now he's going to talk about some people that bailed out. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. And then he names a couple of guys, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander. And then Paul says, whom I handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. And that's a that's a phrase that means basically they got kicked out of the church. <laughs> but you go to First Timothy four one later in the same book it says now the Spirit expressly says in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. So this is in the same letter. So Paul's saying that you know. There's going to be sheep, and then there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And you need to be able to figure out who's who, because they're not, they're claiming to be followers of Christ, and they're not. So in 2 Timothy, the next letter, he, he mentions this guy, uh, Hymenaeus, again. But avoid 
irreverent babble. This is another letter to Timothy. Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and another guy named Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And he's not talking about the resurrection of Christ, because the resurrection of Christ had already happened. They were teaching that our resurrection, our bodily resurrection, has already happened. How they got there, don't know. But he said, they're out messing up the true gospel. First John, in this is a, a kind of a little bit of a word salad, but it's very clear. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. So basically, over time, you're going to recognize the sheep, and over time, you're going to rep begin to recognize the wolves that are in sheep clothing. So back to Timothy, chapter 2 now. So chapter 2 begins with, first of all. So all of that first chapter was just like the introduction to him. So he says, first of all, because now he's going to start giving him practical information on how to manage the church at Ephesus. First of all, then, I urge that supplication. What's supplication? We need to define this. What's supplications? <clears throat> These are all kind of synonyms for prayer. And so I'm going to make supplication and ask God for all kind of stuff. My prayers, or I'm, I might, prayer here might just mean I want to listen to God. I want to talk to God. And then intercession tends to be praying for other people. So this is important in our life as he's saying, first of all, the most important thing of you being in charge of the church at Ephesus is prayer. You need to be about prayer. You need to be about intercession, intercessory prayer. You need to be about praying to me and just me and you time like Jesus would get away and spend time with the Father. And then you also need to intercede for other people's prayers. And with thanksgiving, be made for all people. So he's saying, also, when you pray, you need to pray on behalf of all people. And here's a couple of categories for kings. So they're under Roman rule, and the Romans weren't really the great benevolent rulers. But he says, you got to pray for the kings and all who are in high positions. But here's the reason why. That we the Christians, may lead peaceful and quiet lives. So pray that these rulers that are over you will create a system where there's some peace and you can get about sharing the gospel rather than disruption. So he says, pray with for all people, but pray for kings and those are in high position that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who, and this is a, we're going to spend a little time on this verse. It is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires that all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's a kind of a significant verse. It is God's desire that all would be saved. Uh, he said, yeah, there. God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved. And what did you say, Jamie? Okay. All right. Well, God. Okay. My, my, so, my best. Okay. So there's a lot of people that this is a kind of a contentious verse. So I'm going to do a little bit of unpacking here. So number one, desires all people to be saved. Okay. Not all people are saved. The Bible teaches that. There's not, not everybody is saved. Um, so then it's like, well, God, if God desires to save all people, he could do it because he's God. So what, what's up? And so let me just go through some, uh, verses here. First Corinthians 9, 19 through 22. For though I am free from all, I have made, this is Paul. Um, this is the way Paul, this is why he circumcised, uh, Timothy. Paul says, I am free from all. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not my not being myself under the law, 
that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside of the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. And then this is his summary. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some of them. What, what did he not say? That I may save all. He said that I might save some. Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> which I... I this, how does that relate back to he desired all people to be saved? I'm getting there. Okay, okay. Okay, my main thing that I put that in there is not all are going to be saved. So the question becomes... Uh, and again, uh, I've got my opinions, which I'm going to very forthly, forthrightly tell you my opinions. So at the Sermon on the Mount, when they're done and Jesus is wrapping up, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So Jesus right there is saying, there's a lot of people that are going to say, yeah, Lord, Lord. And he says, go away from me. I never knew you. That's a category. So Jesus says here, but the one who does the will of my father. So we have to say, okay, what did Jesus have to say? What's the will of the father that allows you to get into the kingdom? Glad you asked. So in John chapter six, I, Jesus, said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So people had seen Jesus and they didn't believe him, that he was the Messiah. All that the Father gives me will come to me. So that's a category. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And this is the answer to the, does the will of my father. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the will of the father is, do you look at Jesus and you believe who he is and you get eternal life? But to have the ability to see God and say, I see Jesus, and he's the Messiah, He's teaching here that all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. He's not saying everybody. The Father didn't pick everybody. The Father picks some, not all. And that goes back to, he says, God will have mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy. And he chooses to do that. So back to Timothy. Therefore, this is 2 Timothy. Therefore, I will endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal life. So he's saying, Paul's saying, all this stuff I do, trying to win some, I'm doing it for the sake of the elect. First Timothy 2, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man is Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at a proper time. This is a very powerful verse. So he says, there's only one mediator because man has a problem with God. I have a problem with God because I was born spiritually dead because of Adam. I have a problem with God because of my own sin. What am I going to do? Praise be to God, there's a mediator in the middle. And the mediator is Jesus. And he gave himself as a ransom so that I could get his righteousness and then in, in 1 Timothy verse 7, 2, 7, for this, Paul, I was appointed a preacher. This is the good news. There's God and there's a mediator who di died for the church. And he is, I'm a preacher of that. And I'm an apostle. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Because Paul's primary job was teaching to the Gentiles. So, um, I don't know if I answered your the question, but the point is, is that God's desire is that all would come to repentance, but not all 